to call the meeting to order and if we uh, if you'd all stand and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, a roll call. Eva Henry, Eric Hansen, Bill Holen, Here. Elise Jones, Here. David Beacom, Here. Tim Mock, Tom Hayden, Chrissy Fanganello, Here. Robin Kniech, Here. Roger Partridge, Here. Gail Watson, Don Rozier, Present. Bob Pfeiffer, Here. Bob Roth, Rene Peterson, Jim Peters, Larry Vidham, David Spellman, Suzanne Jones, Ann Justin, Rick Pilgrim, Lynn Baca, Cynthia Martinez, George Teal, Paul Donahue, Kathy Noon, Here. Ron Engels, Catherine Heider, Laura Christman, Alex Brown, Gail Christie, Richard Champion, Rick Teeter, Debbie Nasta, Joe Baker, Todd Riddle, Laura Keegan, Joe Jefferson, Dan Woog, Mark Gruber, Daniel Dick, Present. George Heath, Samantha Meering, Lisa Jones, Laura Brown, Henry Ergot, Lynette Kelsey, Here. Paula Bovo, Doris Rigoni, Sasha Karis Graves, Marjorie Sloan, Ron Rakowski, Present. Mike Hillman, Brad Weasley, Here. Shakti, Here. Jerry Bean, Bill Sunanik, Present. Jackie Malay. Here. John Peck. Here. Ashley Stolzman. Here. John O'Brien. Connie Sullivan. Colleen Whitlow. Here. Deborah Jerome. Sean Forey. Chris Larson. Joe Gearlock. Kyle Mollica. Here. John Dyack. Here. Sally Daigle. Gary Howard. Rita Dozel. Deborah Williams. Adam, Adam Matkowski. Here. Herb Atchison, Here. Joyce Jay, Gary Sanford, Deborah Perkins Smith, Here. Bill Van Meter. We do have a quorum. Thank you. And we do have some new members joining us this evening. Um, Council Member David Beacon from Broomfield, if you want to wave and say hello. Great. Welcome to that. Welcome to the table. And then is it Councilman Member Sally Daigle? Am I pronouncing it? It's not. It's not you. Sorry. It's Ka uh, okay. Well, Sally. Sally is not here from Sheridan. Adam Metkowski from Thornton. We have a new member. Oh, welcome, Adam. Nice to have you here. And then your alternate Mayor Pro Tem Eric Montoya is here in the audience. So Eric, welcome. Great to see you. And. Shakti, I don't see Dana. Is she here? Okay. Thank, we do, we'll, we'll introduce the new alternate from Lakewood when she, when she arrives. So uh, with that, we're going to move on to our, oh, may I have a motion to approve the agenda? All those in favor? Aye. Motion, motion carries. We have an agenda. We're going to start with our strategic information briefings, uh, presentation on mobility choice blueprint. Uh, some of the board officers had an opportunity to sit down with uh, Mr. Don Hunt and Ms. to discuss this, and we're very interested in it and looking forward to hearing board, the board's reaction to this. I'm pleased to say that we have Kelly Bruff today, President and CEO of Metro Denver is Chamber. Yes. Metro Denver Chamber, uh, who's going to kick it off today. So thank you, Kelly. I don't know where you want me. Is this okay or good? Uh, well, first, thank you all for your service uh, to the Front Range. It's making such a difference, and we're truly grateful. Also grateful for the chance to talk with you about this crazy idea um, and why we think it could be so powerful. So in the business community a few years ago, uh, we 
one of the things we recognize is the time we have the greatest success in Colorado is when public and private and nonprofit come together to really solve the greatest challenges we face. And one of our top priorities is really addressing mobility, thinking about transportation in a much broader sense as a business community. And so our proposal today is to talk with you about how we think we might do that through a nonprofit and bringing public and private together to do that work. And so we've been talking with, uh, besides you guys, CDOT and RTD as well, that if we could create a venue where the business community, uh, employers large and small, and our tech companies could sit at a table with all of you and think about what the future looks like, we might be able to do two things more effectively together. One is maximize the investment we have made in the resources we have in Colorado, from our transit to our roads, uh, to all the alternatives that we have. And the second thing is, is to really be creative and identify what are cutting edge strategies that keep Colorado at the forefront to address mobility, because we think it's critical to our economic future. And that's about as much as I know. Uh, but what I'm really good at uh, is hiring the right person who really does understand it all and help us turn that vision into a reality. So Don Hunt has agreed to join us um, and help us start the nonprofit, get it up and running, uh, and then as long as I beg him and you help me beg him, I suspect we'll stay with us to make sure we're a huge success. So I'll turn it to Don to present the entire proposal. Hey, thanks, Kelly. And uh, to advance the slides, I just hit that key. Wonderful. So Kelly did a great job of uh, introducing this. It's wonderful be to be back and see a lot of my uh, old friends. I was at CDOT for four years. Uh, I enjoyed working with all of you. You can't do anything in the state of Colorado. I knew this because I lived here for a long time. 35 years uh, without the, the uh, partnership of local government, cities and counties. So uh, that's really what I'm here to talk about today. This is a very crazy idea. Uh, this will be unlike anything I think is being done uh, anywhere in the country right now. So uh, I would just ask for uh, 10 minutes of your attention and then some really good questions to see if we can't flesh this out. So I learned a few things when I was uh, CDOT director uh, up until nine months ago when I left to have a little bit more flexibility in my time. Uh, I learned that, uh, you know, we're coming up to a time right now, RTD has dominated and done a great job with, uh, as Phil Washington always said, building as much as we could, as fast as we could, and uh, that all comes home to roost in 2016 with the opening of the Flatiron Flyer, the A-line to the airport, the University of Colorado A-line. I think I have to pay a fine if I don't say <laughs> University of Colorado. The Westminster B-line, the Wheat Ridge G-line, and the Aurora uh, R-line. That's an incredible set of uh, fixed rail opening under fast tracks. And so the question that I'm starting to be asked, I bet some of you will start to be asked in the upcoming months is, uh, what's next? What's the strategic direction of the Denver metro area to make the most of this $5 billion or more uh, fast tracks investment? And it's certainly more if you go back to the original southeast and southwest lines. How do we really make sure that they all work? What's our, our going forward strategy? So um, another driver here is that uh, more than ever before, mobility will be the critical element in keeping Denver healthy. I think that we've made a great investment in fast tracks. Uh, we have uh, great partnerships in terms of uh, public and private sectors. Uh, we have great companies that have been here for a long time and new companies hiring and bringing in highly educated people to keep that uh, Colorado phenomenon going in terms of our uh, economic health. But uh, I think we're going to be at a point with the growth that we're looking at over the next 5, 10, and 20 years that transportation, but really mobility. And what's the difference? Maybe there isn't any difference, but I like to say there's a little bit of a difference here. When we're talking about transportation, I think very often we're talking about the facilities that the public sector builds. When we talk about mobility, and that's really where everything is going with technology, we're talking about the trip. How do I get from point A to point B as efficiently and effectively as I can? So at CDOT, when I would go out and talk to folks in the metro area and talk about a new program of mobility or transportation, or across the state, 
Uh, we had Impact 64. We had Metro mayors participating and county commissioners participating with uh, Jim Gunning, who led that effort in M Impact 64. It was so hard to get large employers at the table to really round out that discussion. And my goodness, if you don't get large employers at the table in Colorado, if you are eventually going to talk about a tax increase, you just can't get there. So that was very frustrating, frustrating to me over a four-year period. And I thought, how could we bring employers, large employers, into this discussion, help educate them, help them uh, achieve buy-in and why mobility is so important to the economy, so important in attracting their future employees. And then the other part of that, and this was a bit frustrating in four years, uh, three very separate agencies when we talk about CDOT, RTD, and Dr. Cog. They're all composed differently, certainly anything that happens in the metro area by way of transporta transportation has to eventually come to this body, no doubt about that. But I think the planning processes are different, the outlooks have been different, and I thought, is there a way to get better strategic alignment among those three agencies and at the same time bring in that, that fourth partner, the private sector, to go forward? And then most important of all in some ways is, uh, I, uh, as I look back over my four years, I'm almost stunned about how technology began to influence mobility and transportation in this entire country. Uh, when I began uh, four years ago, uh, the, the national organization asked me to chair a committee. And I said, no, I don't have time. We have a lot of problems in Colorado. But then uh, six months later, I chaired the uh, the operation, Systems Operations Committee for the national organization, which began to get all of the discussions going about connected mobility, uh, shared mobility, and then finally automated mobility. And I watched over a three-year period to going from virtually it being a dream of 25 years down the line that we're going to change the way we travel to an immediate kind of impact on the way we travel every day. And I'll talk just a little bit about connected, shared, and automated mobility and what that is. And it's really easy. You can use Uber and Lyft as the examples. Uh, connected mobility is when you take your app out and press the button, and it tells you that you'll have an Uber driver showing up to take you wherever you want to go. And you can look up the price, uh, and they'll be there in four minutes, and you can watch that car arrive. That's connected mobility. Uber, Lyft, and other providers are doing that. Shared mobility is when you get that driver not only to pick you up, but pick someone else up and get away from the single occupant vehicle. And uh, Lyft Line and Uber Pool are starting to do that in some metropolitan areas. And then finally, automated mobility. There's no doubt that every uh, car company from the high-end ones like Tesla to the more min uh, mainstream auto manufacturers like Ford are moving forward with driverless vehicles. Uh, Uber is now also moving forward with uh, driverless car technology. And uh, what seemed like something that might happen in 15 or 20 years is going to be here inside of five years. We will start to see truly driverless vehicles available within five years. Now you might say, why, why would I want to have a driverless vehicle? I, I guess I don't know why I would want one, but I'll tell you what, Uber wants one because if you can have driverless vehicles, if you can have mobility as a service, uh, we don't have to own the cars that we have right now. We can get higher occupancy in those vehicles, we can get more utility out of those vehicles, and probably the best news of all I think when you look at mobility as a service going forward with those vehicles, they're probably going to be electric vehicles. And a lot of the problems we have, especially here in the Denver metro area with carbon emissions, uh, it's going to have the biggest impact that we could ever imagine. It will absolutely turn on its head all of the programs we have trying to get to lower emissions, lower carbon uh, output. So, you know, I'm a real believer in this. I learned a lot over the three years uh, working in this nationally. 
Uh, I was at the International Conference just a couple of months ago, and uh, all of this is coming at us pretty quickly. I'll just uh, say a couple more things. Uh, this was something out of an article last week in terms of Uber. Uber is actually testing how they can start to replace mass transit. They're looking for ways to pick up multiple passengers as a car, as the car moves down the street, picking someone up, discharging, picking someone up, discharging. It totally changes the model of public transit. In fact, it starts to blur the lines of what's public transit versus tri private mobility. And then finally, what are our responsibilities in the public sector to be ready for this? Well, what that little quote says is we don't know what the hell to do about it. It's like pondering the imponderable. Well, uh, it is imponderable. This kind of technology change is overwhelming to us. But I would submit it's not imponderable. I think we know enough about where these technologies are headed and the kind of potentials for good and for bad that they will bring to this region that I would say it's time to get the uh, our, our strategies aligned and it's time to get some of the best thought leaders in mobility and transportation st to start talking about the next round of mobility direction in the Denver metro area. So I won't read all of this but uh, this is a nonprofit that will create a vision working with the <coughs> agencies, identify options. Of course this is not just about new technology. I think we've done a lot to look at, uh, you know, all forms of transportation and mobility, including more traditional ride sharing, bicycling, walking, that all needs to be part of this. Uh, make sure that we have cost effective solutions, finally for the first and last mile access to that 122 mile or whatever it is, fast track system. Uh, that's a challenge we've talked about for 20, 30 years and never have been able to solve. I think with the new technology that's emerging, we can finally solve that first and last mile access. We'll get better reliability out of our current transportation systems, highway systems. And then finally, um, this isn't just a planning exercise. We want to do this in a way in the next couple of years, 2016 and 17, that we can identify programs and projects and we would be ready if you're ready, if the private sector is ready, to take those projects and programs to a potential ballot measure in 2018. So yes, I did, Kelly did talk me into doing this. I think it's that important that I'd uh, be willing, willing to be the uh, startup executive director. Need a lot of help to do this, however. Uh, what's really different here, though, is we're talking about a board of a private nonprofit that would have seven large private employers. You can see some of the industry sectors that we're talking about attracting to this organization. And then as well, to round that out, I think it would be good to have four local government officials, preferably retired, so that you don't have to represent a certain city or county, but have the perspective that we're trying to do the right thing for the entire Denver metro region. So again, uh, right now we're putting together the final two-year operational budget that it will be funded by chamber companies as well as a grant that we have received, a challenge grant from the Gates Family Foundation. Uh, this would then be the big question for Dr. Cog and CDOT and RTD. Are you ready? Are you ready to take on a four-entity strategic direction process that would take into account new technology, making the most of our fast tracks investment, and really helping the Denver metro area get ready for the future. I think it's a multi-million dollar effort probably, a couple million dollars, and I think half of it is uh, technical and program development, trying to get those best thought leaders along with the best transportation and mobility thinkers from the, all the cities and counties and Dr. Cog, and I think the other half is a public engagement effort you really have to spend the time to help educate people on how mobility is going to be changing over the next 5, 10, and 20 years. So that's where I leave it. Uh, right now we have, yeah, 
enter into a four-way process is what the, is on the table that would uh, bring the three agencies and mobility choice together. Uh, I will say that uh, Kelly and Ms. and I met with the executive director of CDOT. No, that's not me. I'm not talking about me in third person. That is Shailen Bat, <laughs> And Shailen thinks this fits right in with the Road X program that he's working on that really is trying to capture and leverage emerging technology. He didn't write a check, but he's willing to sit down and talk about it. And then we've also talked with a couple of RTD board members and Dave Genova, the, if he can get himself a contract, I guess, the new, uh, the new general manager at the RTD. So that's what we're up to. I think we could start this right after the first of the year, but it would require uh, the participation of Dr. Cog. We can't get anywhere in this entire process without this entity. So, Madam Chair, thank you so much. We'll look for some questions. I'm sure folks have some. So is there anybody? Who Yes, Herb. Don, I think you hit very hard that there are three principal transportation groups, and you've named those. And you also acknowledged the problem we had with Impact 64 and the getting the business in. And unless we can convince them that there's a return on the investment that they make, that's going to be our big hump. Uh, and we weren't successful with the previous one. We've got to do something different. And I think the opportunity is there. And I think there's plenty of people that will be happy to engage, but it's still going to be have to convince them, where's, where's the return on my investment? Because you're going to need those big capital dollars out of the private industry. I agree. Any other comments, thoughts? Well, well, I have one. Um, you know, I have gotten somewhat involved or, or an understanding of kind of the Envision Utah, and it's a concept that really was started by actually a news station, if you can believe that, in Utah. But it's somewhat parallel to what I think this potential uh, uh, nonprofit would be doing, and it is to do what Herb just suggested, is kind of bring everybody in the community to the table. And I don't know if you guys have heard Shailen talk about um, his personal Newman is, is Utah. And I don't know if anybody watched Seinfeld or not, but Seinfeld, you know, Newman, the Newman. frustrating thing in his side, was, uh, was and Shailen's is Utah. And if, has anybody been there within the last couple years? Um, the advances that they have had in their transportation system are tremendous. They have basically light rail to the ski slopes. You can, you know, get off the plane, get on the train, and, you know, be at the mountain in nothing. And, and it's almost insulting to me that they actually are advertising on our television for their ski resorts. But uh, a lot of that effort that was brought together, I think, was by um, bringing these different groups creating this vision, and it is broader than just transportation in Utah, um, and it was driven by the growth that they were anticipating. But one of the real benefactors of that Envision Utah process was the transportation system in the Salt Lake City area. And I know we all hear from our, our uh, ED folks about that they are one of our primary competitors, and, and I do think that... Um, the process, uh, you know, as outlined, and, and you know, I'll, I'll use Shailen's words, you know, I am, I am in politics, even if I am an engineer. In principle, I think this is awesome, and I would love to see how um, it kind of comes to fruition and we bring everyone uh, at the table together, because I do think for this region to maintain its competitive edge, we are going to have to start solving a lot of these mobility and transportation issues. And I'll parochially speak from Lone Tree, Two of the largest employers that have just come into our city, Schwab and Kaiser, made those decisions in some part based on transportation choice that was provided. And if you talk to any of the executives there, Kaiser bought a piece of land that wasn't even for sale. And I, you guys, some of you have already heard me tell this story. But their uh, real estate people were driving around town, saw land across from... Um, very close to two freeway, I-25 and, and a 470 exits, and across the street from a light rail station. And went out and found out who owned that property because that's where they wanted to build their next facility. And, and Schwab, the same thing. They, they built their facility between two exits off of I-25 and across from a future light rail station. So these transportation choices impact all of us. And um, 
certainly during my last few years in, in on the council in Lone Tree, and certainly since I've been down here, I realize how much the economics of our communities are tied to this. So I, I really applaud the effort of, of uh, the chamber to kick this off. And, and Don, for letting us know that you never truly retire from public service. So, <laughs> so Don't they, tell my wife. Please. Yeah, yeah. I, I think she might know. But, uh, you know, I've said my spiel. Is there any uh, final? Yes, Commissioner Partridge. Don, excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, really interesting to see that uh, those of us that belong to the Transporta Transportation Management Authority of Denver South, we just completed a study regarding the whole Denver South area, and I think you've got a great support there. And, and I'm sure Kelly's very, very well aware what is going on with the employers in that area. And it was just interesting to note when uh, you look at T-Rex, that was built with the present uh, congestion problem at the time. We're already pretty well maxed out. I think you're very familiar with that. I just found that very interesting. So I think you've got a lot of support and interesting hearing today from the Senate Majority Leader how little the state actually in, is involved in transportation realize how much they would like to get involved but have many barriers. So I think you're going right down the, the correct road and I think you'll get a lot of support. So, so could I comment a little bit uh, from a state point of view? You know, when I started working uh, in the first year of my uh, term, I was working with RTD. They were talking about a four-tenth sales tax increase, keep fast tracks going. I said, let's make it highways and transit. We got to the Metro Mayors, I think, in January of 2012, and people were still not quite feeling the economic love and said, you know, time out. I don't think we're ready for four-tenths or five-tenths or six-tenths additional sales tax. And then I also had the uh, opportunity to go out to uh, Club 20 in Grand Junction and be lectured that if you ever do that again with Denver Metro and try to solve their problems without sol solving ours, you've had it. Well, I took that to heart. And that's, that was Impact 64. We really did try, and you all tried as well. But I hope that if we really send this message of mobility choice, that it will motivate the rest of the state to have the conversation that's so badly needed. I don't want to get political, you know, there is, but I will a little bit. Uh, there is this continuing proposal for Trans 2, another bonding effort at CDOT. And I'll tell you, if there's one thing I know, it's the CDOT budget. I know it inside and out. I worked on it for four years to make it as effective and efficient as possible and get it investing in asset management for this 23,000 lane mile system we have and there's no money to bond. It would come out of maintenance and capital maintenance if we bond any money at CDOT. So we really, if we're going to do a better job about getting ready for the next round of growth and making sure we're efficient as an economy, both at the, in the metro area as well as statewide, uh, you know, it's my opinion we have to be talking about funding. Yeah. Can you please flip back to the slide with the membership? And then my question was um, uh, that one. Uh, I just remember from, from the, you know, the MTD, MPAC conversations that things like safe routes to schools actually polled really well. Our public really cared a lot about them. So I just wanted to clarify <laughs> whether um, that more community-oriented, you know, bike ped, localized kind of um, voice or issue is part of the mission of this, or is it just transit and, and roads? So, uh, Councilwoman, identify options for connected mobility and choice, and I think we try, it's the whole palette. It's all of the above. I don't think that you'd be talking about projects, bicycle, or safe route to school projects in a list. But I do think as a result of this, if there is new funding, you could be talking about a program that would allow local uh, initiation of projects. Great. Thanks. Are there any other comments, thoughts? Yeah. Uh, I see two. So Chrissy and then um, Elise. Well, since you brought up Salt Lake City, okay. my counterpart in Salt Lake City likes to poke fun at us all the time. 
Um, and I think it's important for us to be acknowledging what's going on. I get the opportunity to talk to elected officials from other cities, and they flat out say, you know, I'm looking to you in Denver and what's happening in the Denver region and all the millennials that are moving there, and it's my goal to steal them from you. So, you know, we have an opportunity where we've got a lot of people coming in, not only into Denver, but into the entire metropolitan area, and there are, there are the pluses and minuses of that. And some of the challenges are around transportation, and I think it's important for us to be mindful of there are other places like Salt Lake City and other cities that are trying to do as good a job or a better job than us so that they can steal our people and steal our, our prospects for companies that are coming. And it's such a fluid um, system that we have right now that while all these people have come here, they may just as easily leave. So I think it's really great that, that Don and the Metro ADC are working on this, and I think it's really important for us to work on it and go quickly. Elise. Well, I just wanted to echo some of the comments that uh, you, Jackie, made. I also got to uh, be a part of the lunch with Don and really appreciated um, the vision that you were painting and, and um, also think in concept this seems like it would be a really, really um, useful endeavor and something that we, as Dr. Cog, should be supportive of. I think, I, I, you know, I agree, mobility is one of the, the big issues and affordable mobility um, that we're facing as a region and how we um, solve that using some of the technologies in front of us has um, the co-benefit potential around air quality as we struggle with ozone non-attainment and uh, you know greenhouse gas emissions, our land use um, pattern and really making that work to create vibrant communities. All of that goes flows right back to our economy and in maintaining our economic health. So it's an exciting uh, opportunity, I think, to look at things a little differently and more collaboratively than we have in the past. Commissioner, if I could respond, I mean, you hit on affordable mobility, and I think that is one of the new and special challenges that technology is going to bring us. It's going to make it easier if you have the money to move about and, uh, you know, go to the job that you want and uh, do the other kind of uh, errands, shopping, whatever, but in terms of continuing to move uh, people at the lower end of the income spectrum from their homes to their jobs, this is, has, is not clear in its outcome in terms of tech-enabled mobility. So uh, that's something I think we'd have to absolutely make part of this process. Phil, Cernatic, and then, and then Commissioner Holland. Hey, Don, thanks for being here. Um, one of the things that uh, uh, Wobicon came about with the economic outlook for the state last week um, was talking about, um, in, it was in one of the breakout sessions, it talked about the transport aspect uh, for Denver as well, in that uh, both uh, industrial zoned areas and ability to move goods to where they're going to be, and that um, we may not be the last frontier, but we're certainly a populated frontier that might be next uh, on some of that. Um, when I hear the word mobility, it, it doesn't usually include the, the concept of transport, but yet you want to get businesses involved. Um, how do you address the challenge of what may be some of the things that they should be thinking of uh, as far as technology and the use of technology and getting goods to where people may want them delivered? So absolutely, Phil. Another part of this that is changing while we watch, and that's how goods come directly to our front door, well, there's a trip involved in getting the goods there. And until we have uh, Amazon drones, uh, it's going to continue to be that way. And the latest projections nationally are that we probably have seen peak travel in terms of uh, per capita travel per person, again, to drive to the store, drive to the job. but. Over the next 25 years, uh, it's expected that freight vehicle miles are going to increase by 50 percent because of the way the economy works. So I haven't stressed freight movement, goods movement in this presentation, but it has to be part of it as well. You're, you're right on. Commissioner Holland. Don, I, I, th I think the concept is, is wonderful, and, and I think it will provide a, <coughs> a, a platform by which we can deal with issues honestly rather than politically. Um, one of my concerns is, and, and a factor I think that, that needs to be addressed in this process, as you address the issue, the issue of lower income individuals, 
they're being thrown out of the inner city because of ho housing prices. So in that case, it's going to be very significant to be able to look at where, that, where those individuals are finding affordable housing and provide a, a, a clear and clean and, and efficient transportation system to get them to their jobs. I could talk another 10 minutes about that. Uh, I mean, we, we absolutely have done a great job with rail transit, but then we bemoan, as you're saying, well, what, why can't people live, um, affordably live there? Well, it's the value that's created by the transit station and the land prices that are created by the transit station. So not everyone can live by a transit station, and some people will continue to move farther away from this core of this metropolitan area or the core of the multiple empl employment centers. We have to be able to accommodate those folks. Thank you. So I don't, I don't see any other hands. And Don, you're taking up part of my time now. So Am I'm going to party time. I'm just, I'm as teasing. Long as I'm you. not into party time. No, you're not into All party right. time. You're into the report of the chair time. That's okay. I, I actually think what you're, you're, the message is very important. But if you could just let us know what you think the next steps are in the process. Um, I know you're still meeting with partners and. And I'm assuming it's putting together some kind of an agreement between the parties. That's right. I think we could sit down after the first of the year and start outlining an overall uh, four-party agreement. Okay, great. Spend thank some time on it. Thank you thank so much. It's thank great you, to be thank back. You, thank you for your time. And Merry Christmas, Happy Holidays. Thank you. Thank you for joining us tonight. Okay, we are moving on to the report of the chair. Uh, the Regional Transportation Committee was supposed to meet on Tuesday uh, with the snowstorm. Uh, we did cancel that meeting. I want to point out to, to the board action item, agenda items number 10 and 11, discussion of a waiting list and protocol for the 2016-2021 TIP and discussion of the selection of the Urban Center Station Area Master Plan final study. Both of those items typically go to the RTC before they come to this body. We are doing it out of order. Um, if there are objections, then you don't, as the, if the board does not have an appetite to take these on before RTC does, we can discuss them tonight and not take action. However, I don't expect any changes from RTC, and I think it would be appropriate for us to act this evening on those issues. Um, we can make those decisions when we come to that. Um, so that's RTD. The Structure and Governance Group, um, in the interest of time, Jennifer is actually going to be reporting in her uh, presentation later on the uh, capacity building and uh, action agenda item number 13, a lot of this. What I will let this group know is that the Structure uh, and Governance Group has been meeting for over a year now to discuss a number of issues. Some of that information is being brought forward tonight for discussion. Um, it is expected that there will be uh, changes to um, some, of the, some of the proposals being put forth, and I, and I think that it's important that we have a thorough discussion. The biggest of which would be uh, getting rid of the MVIC Metro Vision Issues Committee meeting and switching that over to a work session, which would be another obligation by members of this body. It would be the expectation and hope that the board members would be participating in this study session, similar to the study sessions that you have at your councils or commissioner meetings. And it would give all of the board members, instead of just 27 who are on the MVIC committee the opportunity to do a deeper dive into some of the issues before they come to the full board. It's the intention of the structure and governance group that things be vetted there and questions asked, answered, um, staff be directed to find more information, to provide more information so we can have a more substantive and decision making at the full board, but with the background and knowledge that we may need. So not everything that comes to the, this full body would be presented at a study session, but some of the things that are uh, significant policy issues or um, the tip, obviously, and MetroVision would be, more, would be gone into a deeper dive in vetting, but it would require another meeting and participation. And we haven't set, we would assume they would meet the same day, but the time, somebody brought up the issue of the time. Um, these are things that I want you to think about if we do switch to a work session. The other issue that um, Jennifer will be speaking on is kind of the new onboarding for new members to this body. There is something included in this document, um, a statement of understanding. I will tell you the intention behind, I've gotten some feedback, which is why I'm going into a little detail here. 
uh, the statement of understanding, the intention of that document from the structure and governance group was to really set some expectations for new board members coming on so they understand what they're quote unquote getting into and what the expectations for, you know, I think uh, to to contribute and perform and represent their communities to the best of their abilities. And, it, and the intention was really um, meant to prepare new board members for, you know, participation, kind of a code of conduct and expectations when you sit down at this table. No one is wed to any words in those documents, and it, it is something we, that is being presented to be reacted to. Uh, it, was, wasn't, it was drafted by staff, but with input from people, the board members participating in that group. So um, I, I want everyone to be uh, uh, cognizant that these are being presented for your feedback and not as, um, you know, and your reaction to them. Not, uh, and we, we would welcome and expect comments on those. So uh, when we get to that, that's just a little background there. Okay, the final thing I am going to uh, set a public hearing. So the Denver Regional Council of Governments hereby schedules a public hearing to receive comments on the 2015 Cycle 2 amendments to the 2040 fiscally constrained regional transportation plan and associated air quality conformity determination. The hearing will be held before the Board of Directors at 6.30 p.m. at the Dr. Cog offices on January 20th, 2016. For further information, please contact the Executive Office at Dr. Cog at 303-455-1000 or write to Dr. Cog, 1290 Broadway, Suite 700, Denver, Colorado, 80203. So that concludes my comments. I'm going to turn it over to our Executive Director. Thank you, Jackie. Uh, I'll be brief. Uh, I'm sure you all know we got a transportation bill now, finally. Um, uh, the fast. And it's mostly good news for Colorado. Uh, the FAST Act provides an additional $250 million for um, the state over the for highway projects over the next five years, and $45 million above current levels for transit projects over the next five years. So all that's very good for Colorado. Um, there was a freight program that was funded in the in the new bill, and there was some. Um, um, some additional flexibility that was added to the uh, STP Metro uh, program. And um, over the life of the bill, um, the MPO funding percentage increases uh, from 50% of STP funding to 55%, so you've got a little bit more money to help direct throughout the region. And um, the other thing uh, that's pretty important was TIFIA. Uh, which uh, provides $275 million a year, uh, ramping up to um, $300 million uh, over the life of the bill. So all that's, all that's good news, and I'm sure Deb has a lot more information if you need it. I didn't ask Mickey to attend tonight, um, but um, as we get into the bill and what it means for us and allocating money and whatnot, you'll hear a lot more about those details. Um, many of you actually participated in some meetings um, with Robert Liberty from the University of Portland um, la last week, oh my good, two weeks ago. Um, time is flying. Um, Mr. Liberty had uh, contacted us about being part of a cohort that he's putting together in the, in the spring of 2016 to talk about making better um, uh, transportation investment decisions. Uh, he's been talking to MPOs uh, across the nation about their interest in participating. So his involvement uh, over a couple of weeks ago was to really come here and find out, were we a good fit for the cohort, but more importantly, is the cohort a good fit for us, or this process a good fit for us? There were 13 members from the uh, group that um, is working on writing the quote-unquote letter to future boards about the challenges that you ran into when you put the last tip together and uh, identifying things that you probably want to consider in the next tip process. Uh, there were 17 elected uh, officials, um, all of them board members or alternates from Dr. Cog that attended. And then there were four or five uh, very high-ranking staff that attended those meetings too. So we got a lot of uh, good input. Um, we're actually releasing a survey. I 
think by the end of this week to the attendees to kind of get a feel for whether or not you thought what you thought about the process that was being um, uh, proposed, whether or not you thought this was a good fit for us. So if you attended, please, please, I'm begging you, please, um, fill out that survey, give us some good input so that we can come back to the board in January with um, a summary of what the survey said, uh, get a, give us a good feel, the rest of the um, uh, members around the table a good feel for what you thought about uh, those meetings, the helpfulness of this uh, process that's being proposed and whether or not you think that we should be a part of it. And we'll bring that back uh, hopefully in January with the survey results and perhaps a recommendation too about what to do next because um, they need to kind of settle sooner than later on who's in the cohort and, and get, get busy doing business. And the final thing is I want to invite you all to the open house at 6 o'clock this evening. Staff uh, have worked very hard upstairs preparing all sorts of things for you to, uh, to participate in, see the work that uh, goes on behind the scenes here, Dr. Cog. Meet a lot of staff that you never see ever uh, because they don't present here at meetings, but they're, they're upstairs working all the time very hard on things. So. Uh, there are a number of staff that are staying um, over this evening to meet with you, to talk with you about what they do. We're very excited uh, for the open house. And there's uh, non-alcoholic beverages and uh, food upstairs. So please join us at 6 o'clock on the seventh floor. And I just want to put a plug in for that as well. I, you know, I uh, have been serving down at Dr. Cog for five years and last year I learned so much going upstairs and so it really is a very worthwhile effort and I know people have got time crunches and everything going on with the holidays but um, I, I, if I really encourage everyone to get up there for at least a half an hour and see what's going on because you really do learn a lot and then uh, I went back to my staff and said do you know this information is available down at Dr. Cog? And it really is amazing. So the staff does a tremendous job. Uh, and the food's not bad either, so go up there if you can. OK, uh, public comment. Uh, up to 45 minutes is allocated at this time for public comment. Each speaker will be limited to three minutes. If there are additional requests from the public to address the board, time will be allocated at the end of this meeting. The chair requests there be no public comment on issues for which a prior public hearing has been held before this board, and the consent and action agenda items will begin immediately after the last speaker. Public comment. Seeing none, we are moving on to the consent agenda. Uh, number nine may I have a motion. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Abstained? Thank you. Moving on to the action agenda item uh, number 10, a discussion of the waiting list and protocol for the 2016-2021 TIP. Mr. Todd Cottrell. Thank you and good afternoon. So when the TIP was adopted back in April earlier this year, uh, it was adopted with a protocol or a placeholder for both a protocol and a waiting list of projects. Uh, back when the TIP call for projects took place in the summer of 2014, uh, there was 140 applications received, uh, totaling over $570 million in federal funds. Uh, unfortunately, there's still $300 million left uh, worth of unfunded requests that are eligible um, for future funding. And since it is impossible to predict when that additional funding may become available, but now that we do have a new transportation bill, it may become a little bit more predictable um, and definitely what uh, Jennifer had said. So in developing and adopting a protocol um, and a list of projects provides that future guidance so when that funding does become available, uh, we certainly could program it as soon as possible. So a draft waiting list and protocol is contained within attachment one. Um, so in, and over the last four to five months, both TAC and MVIC have discussed and recommended both um, the protocol and a waiting list. Um, this protocol, as in attachment one, uh, does provide instructions on how to allocate funds for when they do become available within fiscal years 16 through 18. The draft protocol states that projects will be selected in order from the waiting list depending on the funding type that is available. When the funds do become available, uh, Dr. Cog's staff will ask those sponsors if they would like the available funding 
And the sponsors must keep two things in mind. Uh, one is that the sponsors must complete the project on the waiting list as submitted. And then two, if they do accept partial funding, um, that project would be removed from the list. If the sponsor decides to say yes and accept the funding, uh, then we would fund that project. Uh, if no, we would simply move on to the next project and that project would remain on the waiting list. Attachment two is the draft rank order list of projects. Um, and this is very similar to how previous TIP waiting lists have been um, constructed, uh, which lists the projects within score order. Um, the waiting list assigns three, the, the three Dr. Cog funding types to defined project types. So if a CMAC and or TAP becomes available, Dr. Cog or the list actually would program bike and PED <laughs> projects. And if STP Metro funding becomes available, roadway operations and capacity along with studies would be funded from that list. The projects are ranked in separate columns by funding type, again in score order with the exception of studies, only because studies were not funded within the tip call for projects. Those studies are ranked by how they implement uh, the 2040 RTP projects. So unless there's any comments or questions, the motion before you would be to approve the 1621 tip waiting list and selection protocol. Yes, uh, Mayor Jones. I would like to make a motion to approve the 2016-21 Transportation Improvement Program Waiting List and Selection Protocol. And Bob, is there any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Abstained? We have a protocol. Uh, all right, and moving on to action agenda item number 11, discussion of the selection of urban center stationary master plan final study programming 50,000 from the initial call. It's attachment D in your packet. Mr. Brad Calvert. Thank you, Madam Chair. So this is attachment D in the packet, I believe, page 39 uh, in your PDF. It includes a uh, summary memo and an attachment. Uh, for those that were here in October, this is sort of a continuation of some decisions that the board uh, made in October. Uh, in October, this, the board approved an initial set of studies funded uh, through a set-aside program in the 16 to 21 TIP um, for urban center studies and stationary master plans. Uh, the total amount of the awarded uh, studies totaled to $1.15 million by your October action, leaving $50,000 um, on the table. You further directed staff to reopen um, that $50,000 to make it available to uh, applicants that, that applied for funds but were not successful in, in, in receiving funds. Uh, the memo kind of outlines the process that we used to open up that process again. Um, all applicants were given the opportunity to, to, to re, uh, reconfirm with Dr. Cog's staff that they were indeed interested in, in receiving the funds. Um, because there was only $50,000 available, we had many applicants that were asked for $150,000 or more and they were going to have to make up that funding gap, so we just wanted to double check with everyone that they were still um, interested in the funds given that they were going to have to make up any um, funding shortfalls. Um, all, pro all the projects and the evaluations um, that you see in attachment one that sort of rank those unfunded projects, those were determined by a project evaluation panel that included um, RTD as well as um, local governments that were eligible for these funds but chose in this round um, not to apply. Uh, so as, as I mentioned, attachment one um, includes the studies that were um, eligible during this particular um, round to sort of spin down that $50,000. Um, the, the, the panel's highest ranking project was a study um, in the city and county in Broomfield, and so they were offered the funds first. Uh, they declined the funds, and so that we then went down to the second uh, uh, study, which was um, a project in, in the city and county of Denver for the North Capitol Hill uh, Colfax Urban Center study. Uh, Denver has um, uh, agreed to accept the funds. Um, they originally requested $200,000 in federal funds, and so they are going to make up that $150,000 um, with, with local funds. Uh, so this afternoon, staff is looking for a motion from the board to approve funding uh, the North Capitol Hill Colfax Urban Center Study. Uh, this does come with a recommendation from the Transportation Advisory Committee in their meeting um, in November, and as the chair mentioned, uh, RTC's concurrence would have to happen in January. Mayor Atchison. Thank you, Madam Chair. I would move to uh, move to approve the North Capitol Hill Colfax Urban Center study funding through the Station Mas Area Master Plan Urban Center set aside for fiscal year 2017. Is there any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstained. We are just moving along. Okay. Action. I'll bring donuts. 
Yeah, well, and th and thank you, uh, Denver, actually, because for taking a lesser amount and making up the rest. You guys are, as usual, great partners at the table. Um, action agenda number 12, uh, discussion of executive policies. Attachment E in your packet, our executive director, Jennifer Scheffel. So um, the executive director, Dr. Cog, is responsible for furthering your organizational goals. And... Um, Recently, actually in August of uh, last year, you um, created this thing called executive policies and that really explains uh, how the executive director goes about um, making sure that your goals are attained, but at the same time ensuring that everything is above board, everything is uh, legal, ethical, moral, prudent, etc. Um, so, over the last year, uh, as we've evolved and, and done some more programs and um, started things like your balanced scorecard, for example, we've realized that there are some inconsistencies in the language that were, that's in the um, uh, executive policies that were adopted in August. So the red line version that you see um, uh, in the attachment of the executive policies is to try to correct those. Uh, just a couple of examples where we talked about goals and policies in the past. We're now talking about strategic initiatives. That's the vernacular used by the balanced scorecard. So we, we are just trying to be consistent and get everyone in the habit of using these new words. Um, there were some other things where we talked about uh, the treatment of citizens, taxpayers, staff, and volunteers. Uh, we. Uh, had some internal discussion and, and said, you know, we have some interns uh, working here from time to time. We need to recognize um, those folks, too, uh, in a separate category since we've gone to the trouble of separating out staff from volunteers. We need to add interns as well. Um, so really, that's uh, there were some other documents in here that are referenced, and um, we are suggesting some uh, changes that uh, recognize the actual document name where certain policies, uh, particularly fiscal uh, management policies, can be found. Uh, but other than that, it's pretty, um, it's pretty straightforward. There aren't any, any big changes here. It was really for clarity and consistency and using our new vernacular that we've adopted with the balanced scorecard. I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. Uh, Commissioner Jones. So I just had a uh, couple of quick ones. Um, on policy 4.8, I'm thinking it might be a typo, but it says maintain at a minimum of annual expenditures. I'm not sure what that was to get at. And if I could piggyback on that, uh, I had a question on that as well, because if you read through it as recommended by the independent auditor, so does the independent auditor annually make recommendations of minimum balances, or how, can you just, Jennifer, talk us through that process because I know the city has a po my city has a policy on that but and typically all organizations do so if it's not going to be this percentage anymore what is it going to be right. um, well and the reason we, we are suggesting changing the language is because things do change and the auditor could come back with a different recommendation than they had before it would be very simple to ask the auditor to include that recommendation in the um, in each annual audit, uh, but again, the reason we put the more um, flexible language in here was so that every time um, the auditor makes a recommendation, that we didn't have to remember uh, to to come back into this document and make that change. Um, I, I found that Dr. Cog just over time that when you have the same policy listed in several different places uh, because of staff attrition or you just kind of forget. Uh, it's easier to have a policy listed in one place and then uh, reference that place from then on. So um, I'm happy to put in here that, um, or to add some additional language that says that the auditor will make that recommendation on an annual basis when the, uh, when the organization gets its um, uh, gets its audit, independent audit. And just so I understand, so then the auditor would be making the recommendation for the following year? Mm-hmm. And it may be the same for, right, that's, for right. several years. But I do, I do think it's important to have that language in there okay. that, that, that the auditor is going, because if you leave it like that and you don't put something in the auditor's document, the, 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 right. there's not going to ever be, I don't remember getting a recommendation ever for any, anybody on the admin committee 
remind me if we have a recommendation from the auditor about what our reserve should be. I don't recall seeing that information. So I do think we need to make sure we have it in there. And the auditor has given us recommendations, but they haven't included it in the document, in the, document right. in the formal document that they provide. So we can definitely put that in here. Perfect. Shakti. I guess I don't know why you wouldn't have some number here that might be lower than what you would want ideally, and then like the auditor is not going to recommend less than that amount, and so the <laughs> auditor's re recommendation would then be above that. I see Roxy kind of fidgeting back there. I don't know. Do you want to re you want to address this? Oh, Ro I can tell you do. Roxy Ronson is the director <laughs> running to that mic <laughs> of administration and finance. So basically, the auditor, um, when we work through the budget, um, recommends like operating expense. Is this on? Can you hear yeah. me? Okay. Approximately where we should be. Um, you know, that's dependent on a lot of things, including our rent. And so the rent goes down. So that that number may fluctuate. I'm sorry. What world do you live in where rent goes down? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, we, we start paying off our obligation each year, so that goes down. So we don't have that huge amount. So, But we can certainly change the language, too. Yeah, but, but to Shakti's point, um, typically there, there is kind of a minimum. I mean, so, so what are your thoughts on providing some minimum and then having the, instructing the auditor to come up with a number every sure. year. And, 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 and given that, then what minimum have you, in your experience here, for God, Roxy, how long has it been? <laughs> I don't even want to go there with you. To that. But, no, but uh, how long, uh, you know, what, what do you think would be an appropriate? Well, well, right now in the budget, we have three months of operating expense to shut down the agency. Mm -hmm. So we say between eight and ten million dollars is what. So would it, would it, the, would the language three months of operating expense yes, be I would an appropriate that. thing? That, yes. Right. Okay. And I, I think that makes a lot yep. of sense. And then that way instead of a minimum percentage. Yep. Yeah. Thank okay. You. Thank you. Uh, Mayor Hutchinson. Yeah, I kind of agree with Casey. What we're talking about is to put a dollar figure in there, technically we'd have to come back and change it every time the right. dollar figure wasn't made. But if you describe a point that you're going to reach, such as three months operating capital because you don't know what the operating capital is going to be and it could be different every month right so right. Uh, leaving this kind of somewhat flexible but still within the control of the auditor's recommendation i think is much better than trying to zero in on a particular dollar figure right uh there's uh <laughs> council member Sinanic. thank you for your hesitation i'm sorry <laughs> <laughs> Um, actually, actually, on setting reserve levels, I, I think it would be beneficial if um, at least some group uh, had a discussion, uh, possibly facilitated by the auditor, that deals with the risk factors for the various different reserves and actually has that and bringing back a set of recommendations then for the board to adopt rather than necessarily abdicating, uh, that's a value statement word, uh, to the auditors to, to set those levels. I think it's actually a responsibility we should take and that we should also have an understanding of then what are the risk factors involved in the various different reserves. And I think uh, Council Member Sinatic makes a good point and I will let you know that the Structure and Governance Group is also looking at um, the work of the admin committee and there is discussion about increasing uh, the engagement scrutiny is a little too strong of a word with the budget and this is one of the issues that will be taken up by that body and and recommendations will be coming back to the full board but um, I think uh, we're not going to lose that and I think it makes a lot of sense but for the purposes of this document right now um, I think that the language that Mayor Atchison suggested with then the fallback of the um, to be re reviewed by the auditor annually and, and a recommendation made I think covers our bases for now and I think um, there may be some changes to some of this after the work is completed by the Structure and Governance Group. But are there any other comments? Yes, Commissioner Jones. I actually had another one that I didn't sneak in fast enough. I had a question about, and this is switching policies to 6.6. .6. Uh, 
which talks about protection from loss or significant damage of intellectual property. And it, it makes sense um, at, at one level, absolutely. And you don't want, you know, Dr. Cog work product to be used by sort of private entities to make a profit. On the other hand, Dr. Cog's funded by public monies. And so Dr. Cog projects and products that have a public purpose um, it seems like we would want to share and get the information and the data out. So I'm just wondering whether or not 6.6 .6 is intended to address that or prevent that. But by and large, I think we want to um, spread Dr. Cog's work out to the world so they can benefit from that. So could you just clarify the intent of that policy? Yeah, it really addresses a, a policy that uh, is currently in the Dr. Cog employee handbook and what it's intended to prevent is an employee uh, taking um, um, a product that was uh, developed by and for Dr. Cog and um, uh, helping a, a private sector company necessarily make uh, uh, money from it. I actually have, I don't know if you want me to read it, but I actually have the policy that's in the handbook. Uh, but this has been, I will say too that this, um, we, we passed this back and forth to um, Dr. Cog's legal counsel and he was, uh, he was satisfied with the language that was in here. But if you're, if you'd like me to read you the policy that's, act, that no. Th th <laughs> Well, I think the intent, I think, is that. more what we're interested in is what I think the commissioner's comments regarding um, information generated by Dr. Cog, we want disseminated out, we, but, but we obviously don't want an, a staff member from Dr. Cog trying to make money on it. So, Well, and there could be, um, um, I, I, I can't think of a great example right now, but there could be, um, um, even confidential information um, that would that would fall under this at, at certain periods of time. I guess what I'm asking is, can we clarify it? Because the, what you're trying to do is right and good, but to clarify that w a lot of what Dr. Cog produces in terms of information and data and tools, we are trying to get local governments to use. We are. And so just to make that distinction in this this policy I think would okay. be helpful. So maybe we'll, what we'll do is um, take that policy that's in the handbook and come up with some language that gets more to, to your point. I, I think Mayor Rakowski had a comment as well. And then uh, yeah, Councilmember Pfeiffer. I'll, I'll make it brief, but there is such a thing, and you know, I'll defer to Shakti and Joe Jefferson who are more current than I on the concept of common law copyright, which does exist. and that. You know, so when you do kick it back to uh, council, ask that question. <laughs> Councilmember well, Pfeiffer. I was just going to um, maybe we just reference back. Uh, is that better? If we could just reference back to the handbook. I don't, again, this is where policies get disjointed and it, you're trying to find them. It'd probably be best just to reference back to the employee handbook, which then would probably iron out the the issue, I mean, in the private sector, obviously, we're always worried about, you know, employees taking off with stuff we've developed here. There's, I know our IT staff here has done a great job with the development, so I, I still want to keep it there, but let's just make it simple and reference back to the handbook. And so when the handbook is updated, we don't have to update this document either. So, Bob, are you, are, are you suggesting keeping the language we have here and then just citing the employee handbook or, or replacing this language with? Well, you, I mean, yeah, just reference back to it. Right. Would be the best thing. I'm just wondering if we can get some words so we can approve well, it tonight can, or not. Well, I'm not, I don't want to wordsmith okay. there. As you know, we do a great job wordsmithing around here. I know. I know. That, well, that's where I'm going. I was like, do we? I'm so, the last person to ask for wordsmithing. I, so. <laughs> uh, no, no, Commissioner, <laughs> Commissioner Partridge and then Council Member Dills. Uh, just to clarify with Commissioner Jones. Uh, is this a, are you thinking that it would be material used by uh, the jurisdictions and board members or just to see the difference between we the board versus staff? So I see that this is the executive policy for the staff, for Jennifer to, for lack of a better word, impose upon the staff, not upon the board or jurisdictions. 
I, I was just noting that there are instances where staff are directed in in a desirable way to spread the word about the data and the tools that they're using and trying to get local governments to use it and that um, and that's you know intellectual property of Dr. Cog so that's separate from the staff member taking something and trying to make um, money off of it for personal gain so I was just making that distinction. Councilmember Dozel. Th that's what I was going to say it's oh, personal Sorry. Trustee Dozel, whatever you want to uh, call me, whatever you want. <laughs> uh, you, yeah. Yeah. Or Rita. Go that's Rita. Even better, yeah. Go Rita. So my closest friend called me Ritz, <laughs> but that's okay. Um, so it's really personal profit that no one can personally profit from the intellectual property. I mean, it doesn't matter. It could be any of us, too. None of us should personally profit from this. Or if there's confidential information, not disseminate that until it's available for the public. If you want to say something like those two things, maintain the confidentiality and not personally profit from the from the material created by Dr. Cog. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mayor Noon. So to make an attempt at the wordsmithing that we hate to do, um, <laughs> perhaps it it reads one of two ways. One, it could read like 6.3. A policy exists to ensure protection from blah 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 or it could say policies are in place for the protection of but if you just want to be consistent it could read just like 6-3 mm -hmm. and just make it very simple and then that then your policy can address all those other items that we just discussed would that be satisfactory to those that had concerns Good fix. I'm seeing a lot of heads nodding so I think so thank you Mayor Noon are there any other any, any, blah, blah, blah. any other comments on this document? I, I so I see two. Um, if if the board is has an appetite to uh, to approve this, we would like uh, edits on 4.8 to include language that states um, a minimum of three months of operating. Was it expenses or capital? Expensive. Expenses. Uh, and then, um, and uh, the the and or as recommended by the independent auditor, th those two things. And then on 6.6, 6, um, we are going to say a policy, and I would assume we'd put the policy number or policy. I think if we. I think if you just say a policy in place, because if you refer to a number, the next that time you renumber okay. something that to just says a policy, just have it read exactly like a policy, a policy exists, exists um, to ensure protection from loss or significant damage. Okay. Is, uh, is the board comfortable with the, that language? If so, I'll look for a motion. Robin and with the edits. Yeah. All those in favor? Discussion on this? All those in favor? I opposed, abstained. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Actually, very good work, everyone, on that. Thank you. Team effort. Love that. All right, moving on to uh, action agenda item number 13, discussion of the capacity building program for members and work session guidelines. Attachment F, Jerry Stiegel, Director of Organizational Development. Mr. Stiegel. Thank you. Good evening. Thanks for your time. <laughs> now, Jackie has set this up pretty well, so I'm going to clip through this and then go back and see if we have questions. But a couple things, a couple topics I have in front of you today. Work session guidelines, capacity building onboarding program. But I'm here just to talk and represent those folks that have participated for some time, as you heard, over a year plus, really, in the structure and governance group. And first, I'd just like to ask those folks if you would stand for just a moment if you have participated in either group, will you, okay, I was just going to give you some exercise, but raise your hand, that's fine, please. Now, for the rest of you, would you give them a round of applause, because they have actually spent an inordinate amount of time in meetings, multiple meetings, to work on things that will help, um, you know, Dr. Cog in general, help the board and so forth. So they went well beyond uh, the call of duty. Yes, I'd say two are in order. Please go get them. 
<laughs> no, you have to stay here to vote. <laughs> oh, we do? Okay. Mm -hmm. So, um, also, I'd like to offer it to those folks that were a part of this group over the course of a, almost two years to provide comments, background, anything you want as I go through a few things here. Uh, but I think it would be helpful for other board members to hear some of the background or some of the rationale for it. First topic, transitioning MVIC to a work session, and it was set up in this way. Really, it was designed to help board members and alternates get up to speed on key issues coming before the board eventually for a vote. Um, there is a motion in front of you, but I would like to stop for a moment and see if there are any structured governance members that would like to comment on how this came about or the reason for it. I know Jackie set that up early, so. You know, I also want to invite um, Anthony Graves. Anthony, would you just come up to the table if you don't mind? Anthony has been a stalwart in the participation Absolutely. in this group, and I, I think his comments would be helpful should he choose to participate in this discussion. So, so thank you, Anthony. And then, please, anyone? Yeah. Any other comments? Anything you want to provide? Miss, Mr. Roth. You kind of mentioned it earlier, but I think it's important to make specific note of the fact that um, part of the reason we talked about having this working session is so that we don't rehash the same thing in two different meetings. And so you talked about it. I just wanted to reemphasize that uh, this is open to all board members and their alternates, and if only one, either a board member or an alternate, especially if an alternate is in attendance, they need to make sure that they inform their board member very well on what took place and what decisions were made, because it will be, um, as we discussed, if approved by this board, it will be uh, the chair's discretion to stop somebody at the board meeting and say, we have already discussed that at length in the working session, and we came to this conclusion, so we don't have that groundhog day of going over the same issue again and again and again. So I think it's very important that we, again, reemphasize attendance and participation in this working session. Shakti and then um, Mayor Jones. That's exactly true, and um, the other part of it, and maybe part of the groundhog problem, is that um, where not every jurisdiction was has been on MVIC, there was concern that that people weren't in the first conversation, and even some, like, well, who's there, and what happened, you know, like some concerns there. So this is to say... Um, we don't want to have the same conversation twice, and everybody is sh should be a part of both conversations. And the the disadvantage is that it means every member then has two meetings that they need to go to. So. Mayor Jones, and then and Mr. Pfeiffer. So I do support this notion of not revisiting things and having a, maybe a more informal work session where you can go deeper. I will say that f from a city council where it is, and I know this is for a bunch of you, essentially a volunteer position where people have day jobs, coming down twice a month for multiple hours um, involving things that you actually have to read, um, it it's really tough. So I guess if we're going to go this route, and I since I know from all the conversations there's some men momentum in that direction, I guess, I would like the roles of alternates and board members to be such that if two come, they both participate. If only one column, it doesn't matter which one. Um, if the alternate's got to fill in for the board member, to me it's really complicated um, who can participate, who can sit at the table, who can vote, and you've got to get permission in order to vote if you aren't the board member and you show up. Anyhow, if we could make all of that much simpler so that we really could tag team it if we have to for city council members who are volunteers and can't necessarily always do both. That would really help, I think, make it a more functional transition. Um, so if you do have to share it between two people, they can really seamlessly fill in. Um, I don't feel that that is the case, how we have things set up now. So. And so if I, if I could just interject, and I think you raise an excellent point that probably haven't thoroughly vetted and maybe that's one that we can throw back to the structure and governance group to, instead of trying to figure it out tonight how we might work that out ask them to to think about because with 
with MVIC, the rules were different, and we are, those would not be the rules anymore as we move forward into this. So I do think there would be the expectation that if, well, I don't want to say anything, but I'm saying can we kick it back? Are you comfortable with that for the purposes of tonight's discussion? Okay, but I, thank you for raising that point. Mr. Pfeiffer. Well, I mean, you're go to, to Mayor Jones' point, I mean, we're trying to be more effective, right. eff more efficient to our time, I and mean, we all come down here and spend three, five, six hours at least this night we do, um, and even more, depending on your role. I, I mean, talking about, um, I think it was a little bit earlier, we were talking about the commitment we're asking our members to have. I think this dovetails into it. Um, you're right, but I think the issue I have and why I, I would advocate for a workshop is because of the Groundhog Day, and that, that means that my MVIC time was just a waste of another three hours because we're just revisiting it. So we need somebody here that's committed, either your alternate or the board member, to be either at both would be probably ideal. Um, you know, I, I was more concerned when, when on the governance committee, I was concerned with our time because of exactly what you're saying. It's not easy for some of us to come down here two, three, four, five times a month. Um, but I think it would maybe even shorten this meeting if we iron some of it out in a workshop. And maybe this meeting ends at 8, not 9 every time. But those are just some of the things I'm hoping that would happen. And um, I think uh, if I could speak for you, Mary, is in support of it, just working through the issues of the alternates versus the members and the participation. And, I, and we haven't really explored that yet. So I think, it, and I understand the, the body, the structure and governance group really felt that the same person attending both would be ideal, but understanding there will be times where somebody's out of town and you would have an alternate, which is why I think Mr. Roth is suggesting making sure the alternates and the board members are working seamlessly together. But, but um, I think the point, point is noted. And I, um, Mr. Dyack. Thank you. Um, a, a couple of years ago at, at a retreat, we had, a, we had breakout sessions about, I think, effectiveness. And one of the things, or a few of the things that came up is using technology, uh, potentially Skype. I think uh, former council or former commissioner Hilbert had that. Um, I think we're up in Loveland or down. Can down you space. lean in? So or pull it closer. Sorry, <laughs> sorry. I'm I'm still getting that upper respiratory thing. I know. Um, so I, I, I guess to to me it's um, if there's a way to uh, maybe incorporate technology, we have a great portal for everybody, um, and this might be a transitionary step to uh, maybe allay some concerns of Councilmember Pfeiffer and uh, Mayor Jones. Um, if we could just sort of maybe even consider or test taping those and make them available on the portals. So that way we can uh, be more effective. They're up there. Um, everybody sees it. Uh, just something, something to think about. Work session. Work yeah, session. yeah, for, yeah, for, for, for the work session. That that way, you know, we don't have to. I mean, people from Mead. I mean, people from Parker. We don't have to get traffic um, to come down here at at four o'clock um, for for a work session. Um, you know, I think we all want to be engaged, um, but when it comes to time we have to allocate accordingly and uh, some people uh, have jobs until five and um, you know quite honestly coming down here is uh, is onerous at times for those people the labor of love and you know it <laughs> <laughs> yeah. well we make a choice and I mean to me I want to be informed but again I also want to be um, very considerate of my other obligations and to that point, I think we also need to discuss the time if we think, given the fact that people do have jobs um, starting at 4 o'clock for our work session may not be appropriate. I, I, I'm not suggesting it is or it isn't, but I'm suggesting that this body needs to uh, think about it. We might want to be starting that later. Uh, Commissioner Jones. Shakti was actually up next. I'm sorry, Shakti. So w one of the, the things is that we might not have this work session a every month because the idea is that you have it when there's a big issue to discuss. Um, the other, and I don't, I, you tell me if I'm out of turn here, but um, I think that the, 
the governance group was sort of leaning in the opposite direction as it pertains to alternates, and that might not be the right way to be leaning. Um, but the the thinking had to do with um, where so much of Dr. Cog's work is about alternate, I mean, is about relationships, that if you have different people at the table all the time, and Lakewood, what we did is we had somebody different on MVEC than on, um, um, and, um, I guess that's the the that's the spectrum of issues that are thought about in terms of what is the role of alternates if we have more meetings and so I'm sorry if I was unclear about that absolutely it would be the expectation that the board member would be participating in both but in the case where you, the board member was unable to participate and an alternate was alternate was showing up they would obviously be allowed to vote and if the alternate wanted to come to the meeting when they knew the board member was going to be gone, of course, they would be welcome at the meeting. That, that, those are the only clarifications I meant. But, but to be clear, the board member would be the one that we would expect to see for the study session and for the board meeting. And um, then... Or work session, I apologize. One um, final thought in response to the, the idea of having it taped. Um, I... I I think we could talk more about whether it made sense that, I, I don't know how the technology would work, but having people sort of phone in, that kind of thing. But um, if you just watch the tape, then you didn't get a chance to say your opinion, which means you're going to want to say it at the regular meeting, so we'll have to rehatch it. So that's the, the issue to the, part, the participation. Yep. Uh, Commissioner Jones and then Mr. Dyack, do you have a comment? No, oh, oh, Don, I'm, am I skipping you too? Okay, <laughs> we'll go. We'll go to. Well, that's going to be we'll go one commissioner to the other commissioner. <laughs> well, I do, not to be a skunk at the picnic, but I did just want to voice. I, I, I'm not going to oppose this tonight. I you fought in the next meeting. I or, <laughs> no, I fought and lost this battle in the concert, uh, governance committee. So I just want to own up and say that, you know, that I uh, I know that different permutations of MVIC have been tried in the past and. We have yet to sort of succeed in fully, um, I think, ever getting rid of the groundhog phenomenon, which shows up periodically. Um, I have talked to other folks who, when it was a study session before, just said, yeah, uh, attendance dropped off and everybody just showed up at the board meeting and bitched there. So I was like, uh. So I just want to own up to the fact that I have some concerns, but the governance committee really um, was fairly unanimous outside of me on trying this and so I will jump in and try it as well um, I, but I do think the key is the board sort of self-policing itself so that not to be redundant there that if the goal is more efficiency and effectiveness then we need to hold ourselves accountable to not repeating the discussions um, that happened at the study session and and we need to make this work. I think we can, um, and I'm willing to give it a shot. But I did want to voice some my earlier concerns. So we've identified Ebenezer Scrooge at the table. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, and, and point of notion, yeah, the, yeah. Commissioner Jones will be chairing these meetings when she's cutting you off. So Commissioner Rozier, let me just call her Scrooge McDuck. That's right. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, in regards to uh, Councilwoman Shockey's um, comment um, in regards to taping um, what is going on, I believe Councilman Dyack's comment was to be more interactive to, and even take it beyond, say, even a webinar, which I was on uh, today for the new uh, surface transportation uh, bill. But it's to have it interactive where it could be Skype. You could ask questions. You could be sitting at your computer um, on the beach. You know, Herb can be in, in uh, Cancun. You're lucky. And, um, That's and <laughs> going through and asking questions and being able to have that interaction. Um, because what I've seen, and, and um, I had a discussion last week about this, um, you see individuals, different people coming to MVIC that are coming to the board meeting and what is important for one member may not be important to the other member and we keep having these 
duplicate conversations and that has to do with more the governance of, of how that city or that county is set up but it does cause for a a longer meeting for duplication and well we just your person for MVIC asked that same question did they not talk to you um, and sometimes that doesn't happen so if there's a way in which we can be more efficient and effective I'm I'm there to give it a try thank you thank you uh, Mayor Noon and then Mayor Atchison. So I would agree. I think the webinar version would be great, but if at a bare minimum to be able to go back and listen, because you're right, you're not going to be able to give input, but you at least would know if the issue has already been discussed. So to ask that same question that everyone sat here and listened for 30 minutes while we all debated, at least you'd have the opportunity to hear that that discussion had. You still may want to say something, but if we don't have to have the background for every subject, that, that might at least help in the short run. And just for the for a uh, point of clarification for the board, we actually do tape these meetings and, and MVIC meetings, and it is available on the web. Um, but but there's no interaction and, or ability to participate. And there's not always the presentations that we often do not see the staff's presentation, so we may have to make sure that's yeah. all there. I, 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 and I, I actually yeah. think it's something we can ask staff to make a fuller... Um, they're, they're just not together. They're just not right. together. It's it kind of harder for to people to go back along. and forth. I just yeah. think it would need to be a... a the whole package the whole would package. have to change. Yeah. 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 yeah, I think that's a very good point, and we'd have to explore how to accomplish that. So, so can, can I just ask, because I haven't listened, so I know when we tape our council meetings, because we're not videoed, if you click on this agenda item, those materials come up. Is, are, is it enabled that way? No, I don't think so. Okay. So, and ours, ours is. Audio so if, and video. We post an audio and a video. Okay. So we, so we don't have it connected electronically to the materials. And see, yeah, so we have a way to connect the materials so that the person that clicks on that, it easy. you get those materials. So having yeah. to... I think the technology needs to be explored, and yeah. I think there's opportunities there. Um, Mayor, At and we're not going to solve it right now, but, but I, let's raise all the points that we want to be addressed. Mayor Atchison and then Councilmember uh, Knish. I, you know, one of, the, one of the things that I think that we need to think about and this is whether it's a county or a municipality. Dr. Cog is not the one you want to have left over that nobody really wanted. So the new council person or the new commissioner is the one that gets that appointment by default. I understand we're looking for a commitment. And yes, we're talking about some more time. But I think you need to talk amongst yourselves as you're making your selection of whoever's going to represent you that they're going to commit to that time because if they're not then they're probably the wrong person for you to assign and they need to understand I know this is one of the things we've talked to Jennifer about is to get the information out to the counties and the municipalities on what the expectations of representing your organization at Dr. Cog are and if you don't have anybody willing to put in the time then you may not have anybody that's willing to be your representative but that's a choice each of the elected groups is going to have to make and it may be a hard choice for some of you to say, yeah, I'm willing to put in the hours. And then you may have somebody else who said, I'm not. Uh, and so when you make that choice or that appointment, make sure they understand the role you're asking them to play. Don't dump on them just because they're the new person on the, on the group. Councilmember Stoltzman. Thank you. Oh, no, excuse me. Councilmember Kanish and then oh, Councilmember Stoltzman, I apologize. It's a hard job you have. All right. Thank you. Um, my so, own writing. <laughs> so one of my reflections, we've, we've touched on the responsibility of a chair to kind of limit conversation that's already occurred. We've talked about the responsibility of a board member and an alternate to communicate with each other. I'd like to add the responsibility of staff. When, if you look at our MVIC agendas, two-thirds of those things are routine amendments, right? The routine amendment to the RTP that comes up, you know, things like that. And it's my understanding from the discussion we had that those things would just go right to the board from this point on. And so if you think about it, my prediction would be that in years when we're redoing MetroVision, this study session will meet every month, like for a year, just like it has this last year, and focused fo solely on that. You know, if the tip is being rewritten, that'll be happening. But then in periods when we're not redoing something big like that, it might be a once a quarter or something like that. So I just... I think that's a staff responsibility to be judicious, which is, you know, where you really believe there is controversy or you believe it is really difficult. 
those are the two clues. And if those two clues aren't hit, this body, sh you know, this study session shouldn't happen. And so I, if we're not canceling, you know, half of, you know, half of these, or not holding them half the year and a year when we're not rewriting these big documents, we're probably not using the session correctly. So I know some councils have a study session every single time and, and allow them to talk through everything. That's not what's being proposed. This is being proposed as a, spe and I, I use the analogy because I, I spent a lot of years monitoring RTD. It's how RTD uses study session. Its study session is only for very, like, maybe 5% of the topics that they see go to study session. To me, that's a, a good metric to be thinking about. So I'll just share that in terms of talking about responsibility at all levels. So for staff, it's about good decision making. And it doesn't mean they're going to get it right, too. I think we need to understand that sometimes you just can't anticipate something success, you know, going to be controversial. That's OK. It doesn't mean the system's failed. It means the board carries it over to the next meeting. That happens in all bodies, and that's fine. This is just for the ones we can see coming. And to that point, something, if something does show up at the board that is controversial and we realize we're not getting anywhere, it'll get thrown back to the study session to be debated. So I think those are excellent points. So thank you. Uh, Council Member Stoltzman. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I appreciate all the points, and I'm very comfortable trying this new format. I appreciate all the effort the group has put into putting this together for us. I do think um, when it comes to our communities receiving funding that it is inevitable we'll talk about those things multiple times. And until we can come up with a process for the tip where we all trust the process and the scoring and believe that the outcome is completely fair and equitable, then I think we, we are doomed to just repeat things from time to time. But I think for the most part, when we're doing Metrovision and we're doing some of these other things, I think this could work really well. So I appreciate the work you guys have done. Didn't you hear Don Hunt's going to solve those problems? <laughs> Joking. Uh, who, oh, Mr. Graves. Thank you, Madam Chair. I think all of our colleagues have talked uh, at length about the study session. I'd like to provide just a couple of quick words about the capacity building. Uh, piece in terms of onboarding for new board members. I think many of us here, when we join Dr. An Cog. Anthony, can I, could, I would actually like to get a, uh, a mo to deal with the work session and then we'll move on to that. If every, is there, are there any other comments regarding the work session? If I don't see any, I'm going to ask for a motion that, that we, and I'm not going to, that we start, we implement a work session, replace MVIC with a work session. I will look for a motion. Uh, it's, okay, uh, I'm, I'm going to suggest that it not start until, excuse me, February. Because it will give a, uh, a council member, Mullica. So with this, are we going, with this work session, are we going to be looking at the, the alternative way of, of Skyping or, or whatever coming into the meeting? or? Or is that for another session to, to talk about that? Because I think that's important. I'm, I, I would just like to second that I would like that opportunity. And I don't think we'll be able to implement that prior to the uh, February meeting, but being able to participate by Skype. Yeah. But, but with the understanding that that is what we would like staff to come back with a robust way to participate. With the understanding, though, I, I do think that that, that that be the exception Quite honestly, I think the, the idea, we do want people showing up, um, and I will get to you, Mr. Cernanek. Uh, so, so yes, that, that will be explored. And I think we're going to probably, uh, we also need to talk about the time of this work session. And I would say let's do that in, in unless we have an appetite to do that right now, uh, if we, we could do that in January as well. So I, I would, are there any comments or thoughts on that? Uh, yes, Rita. I, Don't. What is it? Rit, how do you, what was the nickname? No, I can't even remember. Yeah, well, a lot of people miss the A and put the Z on, so I'm Ritz a lot of times. But uh, when you're talking <laughs> RITA. But so uh, that was my question about timing of when this, you said replace the MVIC with a work session. That would mean a separate meeting. I was hearing uh, having the work session uh, prior to the regular board meeting. No, I apologize. It would be to replace MVIC with, an, with, so it would be a second meeting that would happen on the first Wednesday of every month, which is when MVIC happens now, but not necessarily starting at 4 o'clock. 
Uh, and if we can't make these decisions tonight, I'm not trying to push us into them. And Mr. Sinanik had his hand up. So uh, can it, I just add yeah, yeah, a comment of course. to that? Uh, so we had the same problem, even though we're very small, Superior is very small compared to what we're talking about here. But we had all these additional work session meetings and special work group meetings and all of this. And we just said, we're going to have the work sessions prior to start earlier and have them prior to the board meetings. So the town board meetings. And that's what I would prefer, you know, if we could. And we said, we're going to do it in an hour. And like, like I think I heard from over here that if you can't get it done in that time, you move it to the next one. Or, you know, because you have to start. You can't have all of us coming all this time. And I chose to come to Dr. Cog as a new trustee. I picked this. I didn't want any other committee. I wanted this one. I fought for this one. So uh, I think this is a very important one. And I'd like to come to all the meetings. I didn't understand the damn Vic until I rode back and forth uh, to our homes with Ashley a couple of times. Was a separate, distinctly, but basically doing the same thing as what this board did. It was kind of. Uh, uh, not very productive way of dealing with it. So I would vote for or recommend, I should say, that we think about having a work session ahead of the board meeting if we could figure out a way to do that. I'd even propose let's start work sessions at 6 and start the regular board meeting at 7. But that's these are all things that would have to be worked out. Okay. I'm going to Mr. Sunanik and then uh, Council Member Kanish. But before we do that, I'm thinking this is going to be a longer discussion than we can have tonight. And I'm wondering if the best way we could maybe ask staff to put a survey out to the body and we bring this back up in January. But I want to finish, not make a decision on this issue tonight. But we put a survey out um, dealing with some of the issues, the, the suggestion you just mentioned. Um, so let's, let's not take action on this tonight. I think there's too much still left to discuss. Um, Phil, I apologize that I skipped you. Yeah, well, you're going to change what I was going to do. I was going to put a motion on the table for uh, this. But um, suggestions I would make. Oh, excuse me. I didn't hear that. So Bob made a motion. I apologize. So, okay. Let's, let's, Phil, make your comment. Uh, sorry that okay. I changed it. Um, I'm, I, I won't make the motion, but I uh, um, wanted to say one of the reasons for the work session was to allow the issues to be worked in case there was additional information that staff might need to gather or, and those sentiments could be taken at the work session. Uh, and that's in part uh, comments to, to Rita's thought about having it be sequential. Uh, it was thought that, hey, we could have some items uh, and might be able to get clarifications on issues so that uh, the discussion might be shorter at the board meeting uh, and allow for that, for that work. Uh, the original thoughts around MVIC were that uh, MVIC would make recommendations to the board and they would end up kind of being like consent agenda items and they wouldn't get reworked. Well, that's not been the way we've operated uh, and we've tended to, to rehash this. And so it's taking uh, that and trying to say, okay, let's hash it and if we need some additional clarification. So there's almost a, um, an opportunity for taking a sentiment and a first reading and allowing for those clarifications to come by the time we get to the second reading, uh, then being the, uh, the board meeting. Uh, and uh, uh, the other part that um, I might suggest for some of those folks that do have day jobs is as we're looking at making this, um, uh, uh, there's two suggestions. One is to put the start time at 6 so that those folks that do have day jobs, it ends up being less conflicting. Uh, I know that's an imposition for staff, but um, so be it. Uh, second, uh, I would look for a plan that would say uh, we would have an automatic review uh, that would occur after 12 months. So we'd have a chance to actually gather sentiment among the board members on whether to continue or tweak uh, whatever approach we do have. Thank you. Councilmember Kanish and then uh, Executive Director would like to comment and then Shakti. Yeah, it, um, I was going to second the motion with a friendly amendment which was to make sure that we um, edit any materials which are not the bylaws but we have many references to MVIC in various places so that the staff needs to make sure that we are communicating clearly with the public about this change. So, um, so I just thought that that was important. I'm very supportive of polling the um, 
the the board about times for a Wednesday meeting but because of what Phil just described I would not be supportive of doing it the same night in part we have an admin meeting but also because it is very it is very frequent that where issues are very difficult it's not just that we give staff time between the study session and the board meeting or the MVIC meeting and the board meeting to research or, or get something more figured out we also often talk to each other between meetings and find common ground on things and if you have the meetings right back to back you miss that opportunity so I would not be supportive of having it the same night in part we have a conflicting meeting already but I so I but I'm I'm fine with surveying four five six you know as as start times and getting that feedback and then discussing it but I I would I would second the motion to start in February with proper editing and communication of relevant documents so that the public and all of our documents conform and and then um, surveying regarding time and announcing the time in January and thank second, you second to the second okay uh, uh, and 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 I think you uh, Jennifer's got some comments as well Shakti and then uh, Bob for very similar reasons it Robin just mentioned my only concern about having them the same night is unlike city um, councils and county commissions Dr. Cog only meets once a month and a lot of things are time sensitive we're trying to get things done in order for CDOT to get things done in order to meet federal mandates etc so um, that that's my only concern with um, um, having them the same night needing more information kicking it back to the to the following month uh, we're probably we, we're possibly interfering with the schedules of our planning partners too we're saying it starts in February I think the advice was that it starts when we change officers because you'll have a brand new chair of the work session and I believe that would put the March. study session starting in March March you're, okay. you're Right. Uh, Which I would accept. Right. And by that time, we can work out the details of getting answers to the electron, excuse me, the participation and taping and Skyping and whatever the best model is to do that with technology and um, the timing of the meeting starting. Um, staff can. Okay. So, Shakti. Um, this doesn't get to Jennifer's point, but just in the uh, with the idea of having it the same day, it could be a different topic, right? So then, um, then you have time to get the materials and you have time to talk to people about that topic before you talk about it in a meeting. Um, I don't know if that changes things, but thank you, Bob. I'm going to state the obvious, but you know we don't have 56 members here 57 members here to make sure we over communicate it uh, that the members are expected to show up at the work session that, that you know I don't I don't know there's what 28 of us here there's 29 of us there's what half so just I know it's an obvious but let's make sure we're crystal clear that and right you and know with the ones that don't show up that maybe they will I don't know right and then the March that come to more meetings the March <laughs> start also gives people time to to get used to it I, I should also point out that that the recommendation was for if uh, for Jennifer to go to the Metro Mayor's Caucus and find something along the lines with potentially communicating with CCI and let the commissioners in the metro area know what we're doing and these changes that are being made and the expectations of the rep new the new expectation of the Dr. Cog representative that would be coming down and participating twice a month and that that would that expectation would be um, to the benefit of the organ of the city the jurisdiction to make sure their person that is assigned to Dr. Cog is available and able to come and participate um, twice a month at, and you know the start time is being negotiated but but Jennifer will be communicating that information out to the Metro Mayor's Caucus in January assuming we have action tonight uh, Mr. Roth just one other clarification um, so if this passes in its current form are we suspending MVIC for January and February or no okay <laughs> no you wish <laughs> <laughs> yeah you wish Okay, I, uh, it sounds like we're, we're in a good place. We've got a motion and a second. Uh, let's 
You Starting had, in March, we had a motion and a second. You had a motion and a second, and yep. you had a friendly amendment with a second. We've, we've had a, uh, so, so to summarize where we are, we have a motion and a second, a friendly amendment, but the bones of this are we are going to replace MVIC with a work session to begin in March, the time of which will be determined between now and March. There will be information communicated to the public and to the jurisdictions, making sure everyone is aware of these changes that are expected or that we are anticipating. Staff will be exploring how we can um, have uh, use technology to allow for participation in the unusual circumstances where, where members are not able to get, make it to the meeting. Am I forgetting something? Oh, yeah. That's it. So, pardon? Change the references. And all the references in our documents, removing MVIC and replacing it with the work session and those communicated out as well. And, and that the, the governance group will, will, the expectation is, and I think I'm clear on this, that the member will participate. If the member is unable to participate, the alternate will, would always be welcome, just as we have an alternate in the audience tonight, to be sitting in the room hearing what happens. Well, wait a minute. Participating or hearing? I, nobody wants to come and watch a meeting. Per, well, if the member's not here. Well, no, but, okay. I, if the member's not... You don't, you don't get to vote. Yeah, if the member is not voting. Not vote. They were not voting. Vote. It's, it's, yeah, you don't vote on the... No. But, you know, you know, okay. Okay, so let's... Just to clarify. Let's, so. let's vote on the motion, and then cl we're going to clarify the role of the alternates. So th that's not involved in the motion right now. We've heard the motion. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstained. Okay. Uh, let's discuss Mayor Jones's concern regarding the alternates. So, Mayor Jones, I'm going to. Why don't you uh, tell us what y y your pr concern? Well, oh, okay. Well, so we have been dividing up all the the MVIC and the board position, and that has worked well for us. We, of course, talk in between meetings and share notes and stuff. But um, if I understand that that is frowned upon, apparently, going forward. I guess in order for me to try to get some, uh, some very busy people that would be good at this position to take my position, um, I need a little flexibility. So I guess to have two people that are up to speed um, and, and able to fill in for each other, I think if that's the way uh, a municipality or jurisdiction can handle it, we should allow that. Obviously, only one vote, but um, whichever one can come should be able to vote, I think. And if if study sessions, well, and I, I feel less strongly about this, but it seems to me if people are going to show up to a meeting, they should be able to participate, unless it's a straw poll or something like that. Because the whole idea is to have informed, engaged people. Um, but I feel less strongly about that. I don't want anybody to think we're double dipping. But I do think some way so that alternates can f seamlessly fit in as an equal if they have to take that seat rather than having these weird gymnastics about, well, you can sit over there, but you can't sit here, and you can't vote, but you can talk, and that kind of stuff, which I don't think is fair, but okay. it's also too complicated. To, to be clear, no decisions will be made at the work session. It will only be um, potential straw polling. So just to clarify that part of it. Uh, it, and I saw Mayor Atchison had a comment, and, and then it sounds like Councilmember, Councilman, I think, would Mayor Atchison, were you going to respond to that? Oh, I misunderstood. Okay, I, I think, um, just to be clear, the way we discuss it is an alternate who came in place of the board member would participate equally as if they were the board member. So there is no limit on the participation of them coming in place of the board member. That it has not been proposed that they can't participate in, as, in the, the same way the board member would have. So that may be enough to satisfy this. The question if they both come to the same meeting is a different question. We did not discuss. But we discussed the idea that if, they, if you come in, you can ask questions, you participate, you, you raise your hand if there's a straw poll, all of the same things the board member would be able to do, the alternate could do. But I will say the intention would not be to have each jurisdiction bring two individuals down to take up airspace because I think that would make that Metro Vision meter and I, and I just don't think it would be appropriate if my alternate and I both came down to strongly continue to advocate for for the city of Lone Tree so uh, Shakti and then so, so I, th I think the committee where 
alternates are treated differently is the administrative committee and we're looking at that committee now and we'll bring proposals about that and we we've all heard that point so okay. cool am i forgetting some did i miss someone oh no okay i wasn't sure i wasn't sh <laughs> i don't read it i wish i did um okay it sounds like uh mayor jones are you okay moving forward with this where we are okay that's what i thought great um all right so we are now going to move on to the onboarding process, and I'm going to turn the floor over to Mr. Graves. Thank you, Madam Chair. First, let me just say that I love that Rita is a fighter and that she fought to be here. That's pretty great. <laughs> just uh, one, one quick word about... <laughs> yeah, Clint, he wants to do everything, so... <laughs> One quick word about the, the capacity building. Just a, a bit of an insider's view on the governance committee's discussion about this. This is really focused on empowering the full board and bolstering engagement. I bet many of us around the table would agree that when we came here to Dr. Cog for the first time, we felt like a piece of driftwood at sea, right? There are not many things that anchored us to the organization and helped us understand very quickly the value to each of our jurisdictions. And so the goal of this capacity building piece is to make sure that every one of us is empowered as new members to, to understand where Dr. Cog is going and the role that you can play, and then to really have some skin in the game so that you are present and accountable. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. I'm going to turn it back to Mr. Siegel and to introduce it, and then I, I know we are going to have some robust discussion. All right. Thank you. Topic two, the uh, onboarding capacity building. I'll, I'm just going to kind of cover this generically a little bit. If you look at team research, new member integration, new member integration is in imperative. Your best case scenario is to have a thorough and substantive integration process that helps new board members and alternates hit the ground running. Worst case scenario, hi, thanks for coming. Go ahead and have a seat and say hello to your neighbors. That's the worst case scenario. And that's probably what it may have felt like in the past. So a very a structured process for integrating new members is a key piece. You'll notice in your handout there's color coding. So this legend is red is new content, yellow modified, green no change from previous version. And you have a statement of understanding that's designed to level set expectations and roles for uh, the board member, the impact that you have on the decisions you make are long lasting and we want board members, I think particularly new ones, to realize the level they're playing in. So this is a, at this regional level, these long lasting, long term decisions you make, we really want people to understand this is a critical, critical role for this region. You have a motion in front of you for the onboarding and capacity building program. And, and yes. All right, I'll take over. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't realize I had to, you know, handle. Well, I, yeah. <laughs> anyway, so um, do we have any questions or comments about the onboarding proposal? Seeing none, do we have? A, oh, we do. Commissioner Partridge. Madam Chair, thank you. Can you hear me? Okay, now. I can. Okay, thank you. Uh, I certainly appreciate the the all through effort by the. Structure governance uh, attendees. It's been a lot of effort put into it as we just had a good discussion. Uh, just real quick, certainly in the essence of time, and I, I've had some discussion with some of the members. Uh, the statement of understanding. I think there, I think it might be a little bit of a uh, overreach, uh, exaggeration. I think it's a, a it's a little bit interesting that board members would be asked to sign this. I think we have to. I would ask that we take this back and have the structure governance really look at it and certainly understand we a civil discussion is what we all drive for and I think we all see that in our council and board meetings uh, with the public we certainly look for civility and at times we have to call that out and uh, I always uh, like that that we focus on that's germane to the topic at hand and I think that's where the chair of the meeting has that option to drive that civility and make sure we maintain that. And I think there's all that respect. So I would see the statement of understanding may be a little bit more of an overreach for us, and I would ask maybe the board structure governance to look back at it, 
truly is kind of a code of conduct at what we do expectations instead of a uh, I don't want to scare new members away by having them sign their life on the line to uh, the statement of understanding how I will conduct myself. So that's what I ask. I'm going to turn the chairing back to our chair. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, <laughs> Mayor Agenson. Uh, I don't disagree with what co the Commissioner Partridge is doing, but in order to move forward, what I would uh, like to present is a motion to move forward with this with the with with this being withdrawn at this time it, I think that meets your needs but it allows us to go ahead and get everything else structure and governors can certainly look at this one dike but this is not a deal killer by any stretch of the imagination in my opinion but I think to get the whole thing moving don't stop this because of one item uh, and if you're acceptable to that I'd like to keep the motion is to move forward this is approved with the exception of the statement of understanding is to go back to governance for further review Mr. Pfeiffer. Well, I think it's important that we discuss why this document is here. I'm not sure the other members are aware. I mean, some of the things we're trying to achieve here is active participation and engagement and to express the importance. You know, when you're part of urban drainage, which I was recently appointed to, you have to swear in. And we're talking about swearing in here as well. Um, you know, being, I, well, two years. I've been here two years now, but I'm oh, still drinking. Well, I'm still thinking I'm drinking by the fire, fire, you know, fire hose on this, but I think it, it's not necessarily overreaching, but I think it's clarifying roles and expectations. And, you know, I'm trying to reflect when I got onboarded, Jennifer reached out. Uh, we had an inner, I forgot the lady's name that was with us. Yeah, that helped. But, it, I mean, and then you drop a packet off and you read and you look to your friends and peers in the room and hope that somebody's coaching you through the, the jungle. And But I think this is a good attempt to at least say, look, this is what we expect when you're at this table. I don't, I'm don't, i not comfortable with drawing it just yet because we, we did spend some time on that. And if we rehash and rehash, we're, um, we'll never get anywhere. So I'd, li I'd like to keep it in. I, I'm not disagreeing. So oh, like sorry, you're catching the chair. <laughs> Excuse me, I, I apologize. So, uh, right now the motion is to re re uh, remove right, that document. To remove this. So, if I could suggest a mediation, in, um, I don't think that I think that uh, Councilmember Pfeiffer is raising the points that were raised by the governance group and why we think it is important to have something in there. And the concept, and so I'd like to find out the room's appetite for the concept of having maybe this language isn't necessarily appropriate, and the requirement, or, that, or maybe not sign it. But or I must. Part of the handbook. But we, but, but I'd like to, I'd like to ask this body to allow the governance group to go back and maybe rework it, given some of the considerations raised by Commissioner Partridge. But to move forward with the packet, take this piece out of it. This, and I even think it maybe it's a statement of understanding is not even the right. Um, you know, board expectations um, and, and potentially not have it be a signed document, um, but, but that we do list things that were just suggested by Council Member Pfeiffer, like active board participation, showing up for both the meetings, making every effort to attend workshops, and um, when you're down at this table putting on your regional collaborative hat. And, you know, I think the things that we all intuitively no, but putting down in concrete and making it part of the onboarding process, I think, does make a lot of sense. So the con keep the concept and allow the governance group to maybe rework it a little bit, but continue to move forward with the packet. Commissioner Jones. I guess I'd like to make an alternative proposal. Okay. I think we're all feeling pressed for time. We want to go upstairs and see what staff have been working on. In the interest of time, I, I agree with Mayor Atchison to separate the policy and move forward with the rest, uh, the rest of it other than the statement of understanding. But I don't feel like we've had the full discussion. I appreciate Commissioner Partridge's comments. I don't think anybody else has a chance to weigh in. I, I, have, I actually think this does make sense. I don't want to take the time. I suggest we just move this to the next board meeting agenda and have the discussion there. And then if we want to thumbs up, thumbs down, or give direction to the governance committee, we can. I just don't think we have time for that discussion tonight. Okay. So I don't know. Did, Herb, did you put a motion on the table? Yes, I did. And, and, it's, and it's seconded? Okay. It's seconded. Okay. Any other discussion? 
Uh, Ms. Freiberg. Clarifying role for us because we meet at the first week of January. So we're we not going to bring this up until the board has another discussion. That's what I was thinking. Okay. Her, okay. That's well, his motion is to take give it back to us to work on. And so. Motion is to accept the rest of the document without the statement of understanding. R so I would ask okay. for a friendly amendment that this the statement of understanding be tabled until the next board meeting for discussion then and, I, and I'm happy with whatever it takes to get the thing moved forward without this document being approved tonight <laughs> okay we have a motion yes. so, and, and then the seconder said yes as well thank you uh, seeing that is there any other discussion all those in favor aye, aye. opposed abstained okay um, there are an uh, how long is this? Uh, I'd recommend we skip the report. Well, uh, that's what, we are going to skip. There. there is an informational briefing. Um, you can keep it three to five minutes. And then you can decide. And well. my suggestion originally was to remove this item. Staff cannot move forward, does not, can't move forward unless they get some kind of a head nod from this body on the new imaging. And I think they want to roll it out the first of the year. It's going to be a three to five minute presentation. So we're going to quickly go through it and react to it okay thanks for everyone hold standing tough okay steve yeah, it's gonna take me about two minutes to, to pull this up real quickly <laughs> okay and five, given minute all right you know what I'm gonna the, go fast. you know a bit uh, but i do i'm going to ask the executive director to give us a little background this when um it, this this effort was undertaken I, jennifer if you could just let everyone know why it was undertaken and what the cost was associated with it i think we'll get rid of some of the questions folks might have had well, I turned to Steve for some of that, oh. actually. <laughs> if he, he's actually just waiting Got for his computer. Yeah, so part board, of this so was, was, was set up to explain all of those kinds of things. Um, really, a lot of this came out of the really great work that all of you did uh, in, in developing a new mission and vision statement. And we've been um, a little bit uh, handcuffed by, and I don't want to be too critical of it, but by the current Dr. Cog logo. So I can kind of quickly go through some things that, that prompted us to start exploring this as you guys were finishing up your work uh, on, on mission and vision and at least introduce you guys to a new brand identity, a new visual identity for Dr. Cog that as was uh, intimated we're hoping to launch on January 19th. Um, this is something that really is for information purposes only but we certainly want you guys to be as excited about this as we are. So let me quickly go down through and get to the part of this where we, we skip the process stuff to talk about how we did this but just get to what the meaning is behind this logo. So, and Steve, could yep. you tell us um, what the, co the cost was associated with this? Yeah, we did all of this work in-house. Um, I was the project manager when we uh, created a new brand, Way to Go, um, about two years ago. That came out of a partnership, uh, our memo of understanding, with six TMAs in the region and some of that work was definitely used to inform development of the Dr. Cog logo so um, there are some hard costs associated with this um, part of your visual identity of course is that you have to uh, replace signage as an example and I think that totals about five thousand dollars I could get these these hard numbers to you that's okay um, and we'll could you just clarify I'm getting uh, you'll hear yeah. the I want some cover here the executive officers did not know this was being undertaken and it was presented to us at our meeting too. I've had some comments back to me wondering why didn't I, why was I not informed about this as a board member that this effort was going on and I will let you know that as the chair I did not know this was going on until Jennifer let us know uh, and it all the work and we asked as well what the cost was associated with it and the work has been done in house and it was a staff initiated and led effort so I want to let everyone know that. So thanks Steve go ahead. Yes okay so I'm going to get through all the uh, process stuff here quickly, so give me just a moment to, to kind of go through these slides. Uh, this seems to be my, my mode of operation here. I remember one time giving a, uh, a Bike to Work Day presentation that should have been 15 minutes and I had five is what I was given. So I take this as a challenge, so we're going to get right to the good stuff. Um, so what you do is you identify um, what you stand for. You start, you start with the factual things, and that's where I say you guys did the hard work in coming up with the, the mission. Then you talk about things that are how you would like to be perceived. This is how you develop uh, a visual identity. So it's all of these kinds of things, and this is the short list of, of the ones that are important. 
Um, the challenge then is kind of to put that all together. I'll quickly go through this. You guys can read that in your, in your packet. So ladies and gentlemen, here is a new logo for the Denver Regional Council of Governments. Um, what I'd like to do now is share with you what the story is behind both that mark on the left, um, or icon, as well as the word mark. Uh, this mark is meant to represent this body as a collaborative organization. So each section may represent each of, of, of your communities coming together to work collaboratively. And as many of you know, the triangle is the most stable geometric shape. So I think this is a good representation of the strong work you guys do here. We also wanted to make certain that we gave some indication of the function of this organization. And again, this comes right from the mission and vision and, uh, statement, where the blue may represent transportation and personal mobility, the green, growth and development, and the orange, uh, our focus on older adults and people with disabilities. You'll note that's the only warm color in the logo, um, reflecting the good work that those in the AAA do. I tell Jayla on a regular basis, you guys are my heroes. So. Another important thing you think about with, with uh, a visual identity is your geographic location. Think of the number of logos in this region where we use mountains um, uh, to depict a part of who we are. I'm really pr proud of this particular mark because we were able to take and present an abstract representation of a mountain here. So I think people, particularly outside the region, will look at this and they'll understand that, that that's the Denver region. Uh, one of the big uh, trends in logo design in the last five years has been the use of very clean lowercase letters, and, and we achieved that with the DRCOG, the, the word mark here. You'll note we called out the CO, again, to reinforce that we're an important part of Colorado. I think uh, the Dr. Cog region covers about 54% of the state's population. And I want to point out that this logo is, of course, complementary to the rebrand of Ride Arrangers that we did, uh, again, two years ago. Um, you can see it's a very similar typeface and, of course, color scheme. So we'll actually have a family of, of logos uh, that work together uh, rather than sort of fight with each other. So that's really it in a nutshell. There was certainly more to that, but I want to make certain and I want to, I guess, reinforce that invite. If, if you guys get the chance, certainly go upstairs and meet with some of our staff. We have great staff uh, here in my division and, and, and as well as uh, the uh, organization overall. Any questions? Thanks, thanks for the brevity, Steve. Do, are there any questions? So we will be see yes, Commissioner Partridge. Uh, so looking for the staff to move this out for the first of the year but understand there's been time resources expended already. Are there any further time and resources expended other than just pushing it out? It, it's really a list of tasks um, uh, associated with, you know, we have to go through and contact all of our partners and make sure they swap the logos out. Um, we have to do that same thing on our websites, uh, those kinds of things, Roger. So it should be pretty minimal. And I'll just say um, this is what my division does. Um, communication, communications and marketing is constantly doing these kinds of things. So I don't think it's a significant amount of, of additional time required. Are there any? Uh, yes. Ja Joyce. I just want to say I think it's, I like it a lot. I think it's wonderful. I think it's modern. It has a sense of motion about it. It's, it's I think it's great. I, I appreciate it. Mayor Noon. Steve, you, you mentioned that the current logo presented challenges. Can you yeah. tell me what those challenges are? So some of the, the things you look at in, in defining good logo design are um, scalability. Is it, you know, does it work at different sizes um, or, or really versatility? Does it work you know, with different colors or reversed out? And that logo, I, I quickly went by the slide, but it was actually developed in the late 90s, the first version of it, which had kind of a gradient to the orb, which represented the O. Uh, we abandoned that, I think, in about 2005 in favor of the current version, but it still is really, really difficult to use across different uh, mediums and at different sizes, those kinds of things. Okay. Uh, that, that's yep. good. I, I good. just... Okay. That was good. I know. We're trying to be brief. Okay. <laughs> that's okay. And, I, I'm not seeing any other ha heads, hands, or motions, so I, I am going to... Um, Thank you, uh, and I really invite everyone to go. There aren't many of us left to go upstairs, say hello, grab, grab a cookie, another cookie or something, and uh, adjourn. And I wish you all a Merry Christmas, Happy Holidays, and Happy New Year. We're adjourned. <laughs>